For the five of you who actually watched the show, as you know, I spent the month of July in New Zealand. It was amazing, it was beautiful, it was winter while I was there, and the show crew were sweating their asses off back home in Round Rock. Unfortunately, half the footage, specifically the Wellington Zoo, the Weta Workshop, Hobbiton, the Glowworm Caves, and a whole bunch of other really cool shit was lost forever because some drunk-ass snake spilled tequila on the fucking SD card! Shut up, Mabel! I told you that was Tina! It wasn't me! Nobody believes that Tina Liar. did that! It was Tina! <laughs> Get out of here! Liar! Liar! Shut up! So, we know that Mabel. season four was criminally short. Stupid college degree requirements and all that. So, we're trying a new thing for season five. Wait, this is our fifth season? I uh, know, right? <sighs> Now, if the plan holds, and, well, they rarely do, we're shooting for an episode a week. We'll do the news, and I'm going to sit here and rant about whatever is really bugging me that week. And then once a month, we're going to knock out an old-school, long-ass episode with the news, the thing, and an interview. So, yeah, let's do this. Recorded in front of a live studio audience with a real live host in Round Rock, Texas, it's the What's Update with Xander Quation. Season 5. Not made by robots. Come on, come on! Welcome to the What's Update. I'm Xander Quation. Here's what happened. So the heat in Texas continues to break records, with July having an average temperature of 90.7 degrees. Aside from a single oddly blissful outlier in the low 90s, Central Texas highs were above 95 degrees for an average of 29 days, reaching a high of 108 on two separate occasions. It has been so hot in Texas. How hot is it? Thank you, thank you. So hot that you mammals have to wear pants on so your balls only stick to one leg at a time. Even lady balls. <laughs> Craig, those Good. are called tits. Yeah, you're called tits. Uh, this may be true. He's out of line, but he's right. Yeah, you know. Now, where was I? Uh, New Zealand. Ah, right. It's so hot in Texas that Cancun Cruz booked his next escape plan to the North Pole and old St. Nick told him to go fuck himself. <laughs> Father Christmas gave him a lump of coal and told him to shove it up his ass. Call it a starter diamond. <laughs> hold on, hold on. I got another one. It is so hot that Governor Greg Abbott had to call emergency services at one of his I Hate Brown People rallies after his tires <laughs> melted to the stage. Shaquille on wheels panicked, thinking that Satan had finally come to collect. <laughs> but when are we ever that lucky? Never, 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 never. Alright, I got one more. It is so hot that with the ass crack soaking humidity, Central Texas received several cease and desist notices from the company that makes Instant Pots. Oh. <laughs> now there's a visual for you. Now, while we're still on the subject of summer, after stumbling out of the blocks with their worst box office debut ever, it seems like Pixar's Elemental is actually looking at a profitable future. The initial opening of $29.5 million domestically and $44.5 million internationally was Pixar's biggest flop. But ticket sales have grown to $148 million domestically and $425 million worldwide just two months later. As it turns out, people will sit through anything just to be indoors in air conditioning. <laughs> yeah, <no doubt. laughs> yep. Yep. According to family and friends from his early years in Brazil, Florida Congressman and Republican rent boy George Santos <laughs> dressed in drag and marched in local pride parades, dancing and celebrating the queer community alongside fellow queens. <laughs> now, this is a far cry from his current status of being outwardly hostile towards the queer community, particularly drag performers. You know, comparing the two pictures, doesn't he seem much more comfortable in drag? I don't know, maybe these conservative old farts would be a lot happier if they just put on a pretty dress and gave it a go. <laughs> yeah, but I hate to burst your bubble, but... Uh, oh, oh! Rudy, uh, no! I stand corrected. <laughs> and I'm going to sleep horribly tonight. And uh, you don't really sleep well either. So, so while we're on the subject of future prison bitches, three more <laughs> leaders of the Proud Boys are doing time for the 1 6 Capitol attack. Ethan Nordeen, Joseph Biggs, and Zachary Rell received federal prison sentences of 18 years, 17 years, and 15 years, respectively. 
Old Ethan's time is actually the second longest sentence given to a January 6th attacker, coming in at 15 years less than the leader of the Oath Keepers with 33 years. Even Dominic Pizzola, you know, the douchebag who smashed and demolished the Capitol window and let the first wave of traitors into the building, got a 10-year term. Pizzola had left the courtroom sobbing and screaming with all of his might that Trump steal won! <laughs> now, personally, I think he's just mad that he ended up in fifth place. There's not even a trophy for that. <laughs> If these jackasses are going to compete for the longest sentence, next thing you know, it'll be, like, most days without dropping the soap, or who's the queen of the prison prom. <laughs> well, I bet these guys are the type to brag about how big of a shit they take. Well, pretty soon that high score is going to go way up. <laughs> Just, they got the evil beard, so we're Yeah, no, the, the beard's totally working for you. I think, I think yeah, we, I don't know. For the second time since his fall and head injury in March, Senator Mitch McConnell seemed to freeze up and was unresponsive for about 30 seconds as cameras rolled and aides attempted to communicate with him. The attending physician of Congress, Dr. Brian P. Monahan, released the, a letter declaring the 81-year-old Senate Minority Leader medically cleared to continue his schedule after consulting with McConnell's doctors, although Monahan had not actually examined the senator. Damn. I haven't seen a freeze like that since Jack X Combat Racing on the PS2. Ah, it takes you back, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Nostalgia. Hey, Ma, can you reset the router? Senator McCall's done locked up again. <laughs> I told you, Mamma, they keep that place too cold for turtles. <laughs> <laughs> he might be onto something there. Meanwhile, across First Street, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Uncle Thomas is in, is in the lead for the all-time most corrupt member of the judicial branch. Place your bets, everybody. Recently, Thomas released his annual financial disclosure form, which detailed his previous failure to disclose luxury vacations, flights on a private jet, and cherry real estate transactions funded by Texas billionaire Harlan Crow. Mm. Claire Bear deigned to answer to the lowly plebeian class about his decision to fly on Crow's private jet, explaining he was told he should avoid commercial travel for the foreseeable future after the leak of his draft opinion eliminating a constitutional right to an abortion. I mean... Yes, I can see it. Commercial air travel is awful enough without a plane full of angry women launching peanuts at your head while screaming, Anita Hill was right! Anita Hill was right! Anita Hill was right! <laughs> now, in the newest addition to the international dick measuring contest known as the Space Race, oh. India <laughs> is certainly pulling ahead. The They're Vicom pulling something. Hmm. <laughs> The Vikram lander and the Pragyan rover from India's space program successfully touched down in the moon's southern polar region, making them the first ever to do so in that area, and only the fourth nation to ever visit Earth's only natural satellite. Their mission is to assess a series of water pockets on the moon and see how easily they can be accessed on future missions and observed for historical research. Meanwhile, Russia's recent attempt at lunar exploration, the Luna 25, crashed like it was carrying Putin's rivals. Oh. <laughs> and uh, finally, <clears throat> Pope, Fr Pope Francis. You, you get the teleprompter back up. Stay on the ball. Oh, okay, all right, fine. What, we got Craig on the teleprompter now? No, he's drunk. So, take two. <laughs> and finally, yes. we good? Finally. Yes. His Holiness Pope Francis is dismayed at, quote, a very strong organized reactionary attitude opposing him within the U.S. Roman Catholic Church. It seems that Pope Frank isn't a big fan of the American Catholic fetishization of social issues like abortion and sexuality. God's emissary on planet Earth is less than thrilled with their decision to blow off caring for the poor and addressing human-driven destruction of the environment. TLDR, if the Pope is God's representative on Earth, then, by the omnipotent transitive property, the Almighty says you're being a bunch of assholes. Knock it off! <laughs> <laughs> Stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. It's, it's so nice to be home. But New Zealand is beautiful and all, but their kitchen game needs a lot of work. Uh, speaking of cooking, while while you're gone, I I kind of watched Ratatouille without you. you. Asshole! You know I love that movie. I do. I know you love it or not. It's, yeah. 
You know, actually, on that subject, I have been contemplating a sequence of seemingly separate sequiturs. That sounds like a new segment to me. Okay, hear me out. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so if you look at Ratatouille from Remy's perspective, it can be framed as an allegory of a coming out story, but many channels with far more subscribers than us have done that detailed diatribe to death. My thought is, if you frame the story purely from Linguini's perspective, you could see it as an allegory for a dissociative, dis a dissociative disorder, namely OSDD, or Other Specified Dissociative Disorder. I did a lot of research on these things after Moon Knight. <laughs> Essentially, OSDD is like a more detached version of DID. The subject doesn't exactly dissociate into a separate identity, but rather has a different driver at the helm to regulate behaviors in an alternate manner. Think of it like playing the same game, but the controller gets handed off to different people. It's the same moveset and available actions, but different playstyles. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yep, sounds good mm -hmm. to me. So, the biggest thing that sticks out to me in the movie is Linguini's physical dexterity. He's very flexible, able to move quickly and fluidly, and yet he lacks any form of competence to act on it. The only area in which he independently reaches his full potential is when he's roller skating. Not only is he fast on the skates in Act 3, but he's also quick enough with his hands to quickly swap out menus and wine glasses, take orders and refill drinks while already in motion. Yet in the kitchen, and without a little chef, he's completely clueless and clumsy despite his physical abilities. Then along comes Remy, and suddenly that ability is translated into action. So, how does this factor into OSDD? Essentially, Remy is a separate driver for Linguini, a dissociative set of skills and focus that puts all of his physical capabilities into cooking. Dissociative disorders like OSDD are often brought on by mental trauma, and, well, Linguini certainly has that covered. We never hear about a stepfather in his life, so it's likely that he carries some issues from growing up early, early on with a walkaway father with a huge legacy and expectations. I think that Linguini likely already knew that Gusteau was his, his dad, but such great expectations of the shame of being left behind caused him to dissociate. His primary identity is what he believes everyone thinks of him, a clumsy, downtrodden screw-up. Then, when we catch up to him at the start of the story, he's lost all of his job prospects, his mother is dead, and his only option is a last-ditch effort from his late mother to get him a job at the restaurant. This pressure built up until he spilled the soup and was suddenly forced into a position where he had to cook or lose his last chance of employment. And this is where Remy comes in. When Guidi grew up hearing about Gusteau and how she was the love of his mom's life, or how he was the love of his mom's life, so he was constantly exposed to the recipes and teachings, but he never really had the confidence to act on it. Now with all this pressure building up, his OSDD kicks in and he has a driver who can get him out of this mess. Remy. Over the course of the story, he associated this identity with a rat, the one that he had to take away from the restaurant on that fateful night. The rest of the story is him coming to terms with, with and managing his condition. As he later gains more confidence and becomes romantically involved with Colette, he starts to push his driver away, hiding and insulting Remy while essentially isolating himself in his newfound fame and fortune. Remy's story is a quest to forge his own identity and runs parallel to Linguini's own journey of identity. Then we get to Anton Ego a malevolent force that challenges Linguini's confidence and Remy's cooking ability. Pushing his identities apart is no longer an option, and he has to properly confront his condition. This is where the story dips further into allegory, as the rest of the rat family throws a bit of a monkey wrench into the system. However, you could see Remy's reconciliation with his father as a metaphor for Linguini confronting Gusto's legacy and making peace with his condition. Similar to real-life stigmas surrounding dissociative disorders, the rest of the kitchen walks out on him after he, re after he reveals Remy. However, the relationship he managed with Colette leads her to come back and help Linguini in his time of need. Managing a disorder under stress is bad, but close friends and family are a big help. Once he's able to reconcile, reconcile his own abilities with Remy's, the last act of the film goes into full swing. Linguini uses his skills to deal with the dining room while Remy deals with the food. It's rather fitting that his final challenge is Anton Ego, a man who clearly has a passion for the culinary arts, but channels it through negative criticism and toxic judgment. Making the Ratatouille brings him back to an earlier time in his life, living with a single mother with a passion for cooking, excuse me, which may represent Linguini confronting his childhood trauma and accepting his past and future in the kitchen. It also teaches him that having Remy around isn't a bad thing, but just a mental care mechanism that he can manage as long as he acknowledges it and takes care of it. In both the man and the mind, he defeats ego through acceptance. The final part of the story represents being able to live with OSDD. Linguini becomes more confident with people and steps outside of Gusto's legacy, 
and his culinary-minded driver is comfortable doing what he does in the kitchen. Linguini's mind is mo mostly at peace between his two identities. Now, you've been with us this long, you might as well hold out to the end. Stick around. Yeah! Oh, hey, I want to thank everyone who has stuck with us long enough to reach our fifth season. You five or six diehard Zan fans are why we keep debasing ourselves for minor, chortle, or minor chortles, not cash, just laughs every few days, well, weeks. The months, etc. But for real, we're we're tr gonna try to get back up on, on a more predictable schedule. Remember, try is the operative word here. Mm -hmm. That might not work out. No. In any case, thank you so much for sticking around in these weird times. I, I hope that in this coming season, I can make y'all proud. But getting past all the mushy stuff, let's wrap this up. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, it is what it is.